Ovarian torsion is the rotation of the ovary on its ligamentous support, causing a reduction in blood supply. It is a common gynecologic emergency that can occur in females of all ages. Torsion of the ovary and fallopian tube is known as adnexal torsion. Isolated torsion of the fallopian tube is less common but can impact tubal function. In addition, torsion of paratubal or paraovarian cyst is also possible. Regarding relevant anatomy, starting with ligaments of the ovary. The ovary is supported by the infundibulopelvic ligament, known as suspensory ligament of the ovary. The infundibulopelvic ligament is a fold of the brood ligament that attaches to the pelvic side wall. The ovarian vessels pass through the infundibulopelvic ligament. Another ligament is the ovarian ligament, or known as utero-ovarian ligament, which connects the ovary with the uterus. Regarding the blood supply, the ovaries receive double blood supply from the ovarian artery and the uterine artery. The ovarian artery arises directly from the abdominal aorta and it travels in the infundibulopelvic ligaments and supplies the ovaries and the fallopian tubes. The uterine artery is a branch of the internal iliac artery and the bifurcates in the tubo ovarian artery. The tubo ovarian branch anastomoses with the ovarian artery. Torsion results in compression of ovarian vessels. Initially, the venous outflow is blocked because the wall of the vein can easily be compressed, while the arterial perfusion is maintained because the muscular arteries are less compressible. This results in ovarian edema and significant enlargements. Later on, the enlarged ovary will compress the arterial wall. This will result in ovarian ischemia, which can eventually result in necrosis, infarction, and local hemorrhage. Regarding risk factors, ovarian mass is the primary factor for ovarian torsion, particularly when it is 5 cm or larger in diameter. However, normal ovaries can also experience torsion, particularly in preliminary kale girl. This may be due to elongated utero-ovarian ligaments. The incidence of torsion is lower in postmenopausal women. Pregnancy is another risk factor associated with increased risk of ovarian torsion, accounting for about 10 to 22 percent of cases. Ovulation induction is another risk factor because it is associated with formation of large ovarian follicular cysts. Prior ovarian torsion is another risk factor. Other risk factors include tubal ligation and polycystic ovarian syndrome. However, the extent of this risk is uncertain. Regarding the presentation, pelvic pain is the most common symptom of ovarian torsion, characterized by sudden onset. It is usually localized to the side of torsion. However, it may be diffuse, especially in preliminary girls. The pain can radiate to the flank, back, or groin. Nausea and vomiting are common symptoms associated with ovarian torsion. Nausea may occur with or without vomiting. Fever can present in some cases of ovarian torsion but it is typically of low grade. During general examination, we may find a low grade fever, slightly elevated heart rate or blood pressure. During abdominal and pelvic examination, most patients demonstrate pelvic and or abdominal tenderness. However, it is absent in about one third of cases. Tenderness may be localized to the site of adnexal mass if present, or it may be diffuse a palpable pelvic abdominal mass may or may not be present. Peritoneal signs, although rare, should raise a concern for adnexal necrosis. 
during laboratory evaluation perform HCG to rule out ectopic pregnancy. CBC may identify anemia or leukocytosis. They are non-specific finding, but may indicate hemorrhage or infection. Some studies have suggested a potential association between increased level of serum interleukin-6 and ovarian torsion, but more research is needed. If malignancy is suspected in the presence of an adnexal mass, serum tumor marker is required for further evaluation. Radiological evaluation include ultrasound, maybe CT or MRI. Ultrasound plays an important role in the diagnosis of ovarian torsion. Features include ovarian enlargement caused by edema or a mass. In this image, we can see an enlarged ovary measuring about 7 cm. In addition, the presence of multiple small follicles displaced peripherally by edema is another feature. Here in the second picture, we can see an enlarged ovary, and these are the multiple follicles pushed to the periphery. Heterogeneous appearance of ovarian stroma due to edema and hemorrhage is another feature, and sometimes abnormal ovarian location may be found, such as being anterior to the uterus. Doppler study is another important assessment. There may be decreased or absent venous flow in about 93% of cases. Absent ovarian arterial flow is present in about 70% of cases. However, some cases may have normal color Doppler flow. In this image, in image A, we can find an enlarged ovary with peripherally displaced small follicles. When Doppler was applied in picture B, we can see blood flow inside the ovary with maintained blood flow during systole and during diastole. This means maintained venous flow and arterial flow. However, in some cases, blood flow may be completely absent. In this image, for example, we can see an enlarged ovary, briefly displaced follicles, and applying Doppler flow, no blood flow is present inside the ovary. This means with ovarian torsion we may find normal blood flow, no blood flow, or only absent arterial or absent venous flow. This is another feature of Doppler study known as Whirlpool sign, which demonstrates circular or coiled vessels within the twisted pedicle. CT or MRI is usually not required. However, they can be helpful in complex cases or when the diagnosis is unclear. In this image, for example, we can visualize the difference between the two ovaries. This is the right ovary, and here is the markedly enlarged left ovary. In this image, we can see the uterus and the significantly enlarged ovary behind the uterus with the small follicles pushed to the periphery. Differential diagnosis of ovarian torsion include ectopic pregnancy. It can be ruled out with a negative serum HCG and the presence of sonographic evidence of intrauterine pregnancy. A ruptured ovarian cyst is characterized by sonographic evidence of hemoperitoneum or free fluid in the pelvis. Tubo ovarian abscess is another differential diagnosis. However, it has an indolent course, fever, and the complex multilocular mass on ultrasound are found. Appendicitis may have similar symptoms, but it can be differentiated through physical examination and imaging findings. Management of ovarian torsion is surgical. During the surgery, what is the preferred option? Detorsion versus oophorectomy. How would you manage an ovarian cyst? What is the rule of ophorobexy? 
In addition, I will discuss certain precautions in adolescents and the pregnant women. Laparoscopy is the preferred surgical approach for adnexal torsion. A minimally invasive surgical approach is recommended with detorsion and the preservation of adnexal structures regardless of the appearance of the ovary. However, oophorectomy can be performed in certain situations, such as a severely necrotic ovary which falls apart. The Canadian Society adds another indication oophorectomy can be performed in postmenopausal women. In the presence of ovarian cyst, it is reasonable to perform cystectomy. In cases where the adenixa are severely swollen and delicate, cystectomy does not need to be performed at the time of detorsion because it may cause additional trauma. If there is a large cyst and cystectomy is not performed, incision and drainage may be considered. If the ovarian cyst is left, follow-up ultrasound should be done after 6 to 12 weeks to re-evaluate the cyst. Simple cysts usually resolve within 6 to 8 weeks. With persistent cyst, a laparoscopic ovarian cystectomy can be considered to decrease the risk of recurrent torsion. Oophrobixy can be considered in the following situations. Ovarian ligament is congenitally long, impatient with repeat torsion, or when there is no obvious cause for the torsion can be found. The procedure can be done laparoscopically involving shortening of the utero-ovarian ligament or suturing the ovary to the uterosacral ligaments. This image from up to date showing the steps of oophropexy. In image A, we can see the anatomy. This is the uterus, utero-ovarian ligament ending with the ovary. And this is the uterosacral ligaments. In the second picture, we can see sutures in the utero-ovarian ligament, shortening the utero-ovarian ligament. In picture C, we can see the stitch in the utero-ovarian ligament. In picture D, another suture is performed in the utero-ovarian ligament and fixed to the uterosacral ligaments. Regarding surgical management in adolescents, Facial tissue may not have reached adult strength, so consider closing the fascia in these patients to reduce the risk of hernia. There is increased risk of vascular injury due to a shorter distance from the umbilical trocar site compared to adults. So use the smallest trocars available. Insufflation pressure should be 12 mm mercury with flow rates of 3 to 6 liters. Reduce insufflation pressure if patient weight less than 20 kg. Regarding pain management, use low amount of insufflation pressure, administer local anesthetic at trocar sites, use scheduled non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, with consideration of less than three days of opioids and to consult with a specialty team experienced in pain management and the appropriate dosing for pediatric patients. Regarding ovarian torsion in pregnant women, management of ovarian torsion in pregnancy is similar to non-pregnant patients, but it can be technically more challenging due to the enlarged uterus. Laparoscopic management is a safe option. However, if the corpus luteum is removed, progestational support is recommended until 10 weeks gestation to maintain pregnancy. And finally, regarding prevention, the risk of recurrence of ovarian torsion is uncertain. High dose oral contraceptive can be used to suppress ovulation and cyst formation. However, their effectiveness in reducing the risk of recurrent torsion is unproven. Another preventive measure is oophropexy. 
थैंक यू